Trap of Gold by Louis L'Amour. Weatherton had been three months out of Horsehead before he found his first color. At first, it was a few scattered grains taken from the base of an alluvial fan where millions of tons of sand and silt had washed down from a chain of rugged peaks. Yet, the gold was ragged under the magnifying glass. Gold that is carried any distance becomes worn and polished by the abrasive action of the accompanying rocks and sand. So this could not have been carried far. With caution born of harsh experience, he seated himself and lighted his pipe. Yet excitement was strong within him. A contemplative man by nature, experience had taught him how a man may be deluded by hope. Yet all his instincts told him the source of the gold was somewhere on the mountain above. It could have come down the wash that skirted the base of the mountain, but the ragged condition of the gold made that impossible. The base of the fan was a half mile across and hundreds of feet thick, built of silt and sand washed down by centuries of erosion among the higher peaks. The point of the wide V of the fan lay between the two towering upthrusts of granite, but from where Weatherton sat, he could see the actual source of the fan lay much higher. Weatherton made a camp near the tiny spring west of the fan, then picketed his burrows and began his climb. When he was well over 2,000 feet higher, he stopped resting again, and while he dry panned some of the silt, surprisingly, there were a few more grains of gold even in the first pan, so he continued his climb and passed at last between the towering portals of the granite columns. Above this natural gate were three smaller alluvial fans that joined at the gate to pour the greater fan below. Dry panning two of these brought no results, but the third, even by the relatively poor method of dry panning, showed a dozen colors, all of good size. The head of the fan lay in a gigantic crack in the granitic upthrust that resembled a fantastic ruin. Pausing to catch his breath, his gaze wandered along the base of the upthrust. Right before him, the crumbling granite was slashed with a vein of quartz that was literally laced with gold. Struggling nearer through the loose sand, his heart pounding more from excitement than from altitude and exertion, he came to an abrupt stop. The band of quartz was six feet wide, and that six feet was cobwebbed with gold. It was unbelievable, but here it was. Yet, even in this moment of success, something about the beetling cliff stopped him from going forward. His innate caution took hold, and he drew back to examine it at a greater length. Wary of what he saw, he circled the batholith, and then climbed to the ridge behind it, from which he could look down upon the roof. What he saw from there left him dry-mouthed and jittery. The granitic upthrust was obviously part of a much older range, one that had weathered and worn, suffered from shock and twisting until finally this tower of granite had been violently upthrust, leaving it standing, a shaking ruin among younger and sturdier peaks. In the process, the rock had been shattered and riven by mighty forces until it had become a miner's horror. Weatherton stared, fascinated by the prospect. With enormous wealth here for the taking, every ounce must be taken at the risk of life. One stick of powder might bring the whole crumbling mass down in a heap, and it loomed all 300 feet above its base in the fan. The roof of the batholith was riven with gigantic cracks, literally seamed with breaks, like the wall of an ancient building that was remained standing after heavy bombing. Walking back to the base of the tower, Weatherton found he could actually break loose chunks of the quartz with his fingers. The vein itself lay on the downhill side and at the very base. The outer wall of the upthrust was sharply tilted so that a man working at the vein would be cutting his way into the very foundations of the tower. And any single blow of the pick 
might bring down the whole mass upon him. Furthermore, if the rock did fall, the vein would be hopelessly buried under thousands of tons of rock, lost without the expenditure of much more capital than he could command. At this moment, Weatherton's total of money in hand amounted to slightly less than $40. Thirty yards from the face, he seated himself upon the sand and filled his pipe once more. A man might take tons out of there without trouble, and yet it might collapse at the first blow. Yet he knew he had no choice. He needed money, and it lay there before him. Even if he were at first successful, there were two things he must avoid. The first was tolerance of danger that might bring carelessness. The second, that urge to go back for a little more that could kill him. It was well into the afternoon, and he had not eaten, yet he was not hungry. He circled the batholith, studying it from every angle, only to reach the conclusion that his first estimate had been correct. The only way to get at the gold was to go at the very shadow of the leaning wall and attack it at its base, digging it out by main strength. Where he stood, it seemed ridiculous that a mere man with a pick could topple that mass of rock, yet he knew how delicate such a balance could be. The tower was situated on what might be described as the military crest of the ridge, and the alluvial fan sloped steeply away from its lower side, steeper than a steep stairway. The top of the leaning wall was overshadowed at the top of the fan, and if it started to crumble and a man had warning, he might run to the north with a bare chance of escape. The soft sand in which he must run would be an impediment, but that could be alleviated by making a walk from flat rocks sunk into the sand. It was dusk when he returned to his camp. Deliberately, he had not permitted himself to begin work, not by so much as a sample. He must be deliberate in all his actions, and never for a second should he forget the mass that towered above him. A split second of hesitation when the crash came, and he accepted it as inevitable, would mean burial under tons of crumbled rock. The following morning, he picketed his burrows with a, on a small meadow near the spring, cleaned the spring itself, and prepared a lunch. Then, removed his shirt, drew on a pair of gloves, and walked to the face of the cliff. Yet even then, he did not begin, knowing that upon this habit of care and deliberation might depend not only his success in the venture, but life itself. He gathered flat stones and began building his walk. When you start moving, he told himself, you'll have to be fast. Finally, and with infinite care, he began tapping at the quartz, enlarging cracks with the pick, removing fragments, and prying loose whole chunks. He did not swing the pick, but he used it as a lever. The quartz was rotten, and a man might obtain a considerable amount by this method of picking or even pulling with the hands. When he had a sack filled with the richest quartz, he carried it over his path to a safe place beyond the shadow of the tower. Returning, he tamped a few more flat rocks into his path and began on the second sack. He worked with greater care than was perhaps essential. He was not, and had never been, a gambling man. In the present operation, he was taking a careful, calculated risk in which every eventuality had been weighed and judged. He needed the money, and he intended to have it. He had a good idea of his chances of success, but he knew, too, that his gravest danger was to become too greedy and much too engrossed in the task. Dragging the two sacks down the hill, he found a flat rock, a flat block of stone, and with a single jack proceeded to break up the quartz. It was a slow and hard job, but he had no better means of extracting the gold. After breaking or crushing the quartz, much of the gold could be separated by a knife blade, for it was amazingly concentrated. With water from the spring, Weatherton panned the remainder until it was too dark to see. Out of his blankets by daybreak, he ate breakfast and completed the extraction of the gold. 
At a rough estimate, his first day's work would run to $400. He made a cache for the gold sack and took the now empty ore sacks and climbed back to the tower. The air was clear and fresh, the sun warm after the chill of the night, and he liked the feel of the pick in his hands. Laura and Tommy awaited him back at Horsehead, and if he was killed here, there was small chance they would ever know what had become of him. But he did not intend to be killed. The gold he was extracting from this rock was for them, not for himself. It would mean an easier life in a larger town. A home of their own and things to make the home a woman desires, and it meant an education for Tommy. For himself, all he needed was the thought of that home to return to, his wife and son, and the desert itself. And one was as necessary to him as the other. The desert would be the death of him. He had been told that many times and did not need to be told, for few men knew the desert as he did. The desert was to him what an orchestra is to a fine conductor, what the human body is to a surgeon. It was his work, his life, and the thing he knew best. He always smiled when he first looked into the desert and started a new trip. Would this be it? The morning drew on, and he continued to work with an even-paced swing of the pick, a careful filling of the sack. The gold showed bright and beautiful in the crystalline quartz, which was so much more beautiful than the gold itself. From time to time, as the morning drew on, he paused to rest and to breathe freshly of the deep, fresh, clean air. Deliberately, he refused to hurry. For 19 days, he worked tirelessly, eight hours a day at first, then lessening his hours to seven and then to six. Weatherton did not explain to himself why he did this, but he realized it was becoming increasingly difficult to stay on the job. Again and again, he would walk away from the rock face on one excuse or another, and each time he would begin to feel his scalp prickle, his steps grow quicker, and each time he returned more reluctantly. Three times beginning on the 13th, and again on the 17th, and finally on the 19th day, he heard movement within the tower. Whether that whispering in the rock was normal, he did not know. Such a natural movement might have been going on for centuries. He only knew that it happened now, and each time it happened, a cold chill went along his spine. His work had cut a deep notch at the base of the tower, such a notch a man might make in felling a tree, but wider and deeper. The sacks of gold, too, were increasing, they now numbered seven, and their total would, he believed, amount to more than $5,000, probably nearer to $6,000. As, as he cut deeper into the rock, the vein was growing richer. He worked on his knees now, and the vein slanted downward as he cut into the base of the tower, and he was all of nine feet into the rock with a great mass above him. If that rock gave way while he was working, he would be crushed in an instant with no chance of escape. Nevertheless, he continued. The change in the rock tower was not the only change, for he had lost weight and he no longer slept well. On the night of the 20th day, he decided he had $6,000 and his goal would be 10,000. At the following day, the rock was the richest ever. As if to tantalize him into working on and on, the deeper he cut, the richer the ore became. By Nightfall of that day, he had taken out more than a thousand dollars. Now the lust of gold was getting into him, taking him by the throat. He was fascinated by the danger of the tower, as well as the desire for gold. Three more days to go. Could he leave it then? He looked again at the tower and felt a peculiar sense of foreboding, a feeling that here he was to die, that he would never escape. Was it his imagination? or had the outer wall leaned a little more. On the morning of the 22nd day, he climbed the fan over a path that use had built into a series of continuous steps. He had never counted those steps, but there must have been over a thousand of them. Dropping his canteen into a shaded hollow and pick in hand, 
he started for the tower. The forward tilt did seem somewhat more than before. Or was it the light? That crack that ran behind the outer wall seemed to have widened. When he examined it more closely, he found a small pile of freshly run silt near the bottom of the crack. So it had moved. Weatherton hesitated, staring at the rock with wary attention. He was a fool to go back in there again. $7,000 was more than he ever had in his life before. Yet, in the next few hours, he could take out at least $1,000 more. In the next three days, he could easily have the 10000 he had set for his goal. He walked to the opening, dropped to his knees, crawled into the narrowing, flat-roofed hole. No sooner was he inside than fear climbed into his throat. He felt trapped, stifled, but he fought down a mounting panic and began to work. His first blows were so frightened and feeble that nothing came loose. Yet when he did get started, he began to work with a feverish intensity that was wholly unlike him. When he slowed and then stopped to fill his sack, he was gasping for breath. But despite his hurry, the sack was not quite full. Reluctantly, he pick, lifted his pick again, but before he could strike a blow, the gigantic mass above him seemed to creak like something tired and old. A deep shudder went through the colossal pile and then a deep grinding that turned him sick with horror. All his plan for instant flight were frozen and it was not until the groaning ceased that he realized he was lying on his back, breathless with fear and expectancy. Slowly, he edged his way into the air and walked, fighting the desire to run away from the rock. When he stopped near his canteen, he was wringing with cold sweat and trembling in every muscle. He sat down on the rock and fought for control. It was not until some 20 minutes had passed he could trust himself to get to his feet. Despite the experience, he knew that if he did not go back now, he would never go. He had but one sack for the day and wanted another. Circling the batholith, he examined the widening crack, endeavoring again for the third time to find another means of access to the vein. The tilt of the outer wall was obvious and it could stand no more without toppling. It was possible that by cutting into the wall of the column and striking down, he might tap the vein at a safer point Yet this added blow at the foundation would bring the tower nearer to collapse and render his other hole untenable. Even this new attempt would not be safe, although immeasurably more secure than the hole he had left. Hesitating, he looked back at the hole. Once more, the ore was now fabulously rich, and the few pounds he needed to complete the sack he could get in just a little while. He stared at the black, an undoubtedly narrower hole, and he looked up at the leaning wall. He picked up his pick and with his mouth dry, started back, drawn by fascination that was beyond all reason. His heart pounding, he dropped to his knees at the tunnel face. The air seemed stifling and he could feel his scalp tingling, but once he started to crawl, it was better. The face where he now worked was at least 16 feet from the tunnel mouth. Pick in hand, he began to wedge chunks from their seat. The going seemed harder now, and the chunks did not come loose so easily. Above him, the tower made no sound. The crushing weight was now something tangible. He could almost feel it growing, increasing with every move of, the mount of his. The mountain seemed resting on his shoulder crushing air from his lungs. Suddenly, he stopped. The sack almost full, he stopped and lay very still, staring at the bulk of the rock above him. No. He would go no further. Now he would quit. Not another sack full, not another pound. He would go out now. He would go down the mountain without a backward look, and he would keep going his wife waiting at home, little Tommy, who would gladly run to meet him. These were too much to gamble. With the decision came peace, came certainty. 
He sighed deeply and relaxed, and then it seemed to him that every muscle in his body had been knotted with strain. He turned on his side and with great deliberation gathered his lantern, his sack, his hand pick. He had won. He had defeated the crumbling tower. He had defeated his own greed. He backed easily, without the caution that had marked his earlier movements in the cave. His blind, thrusting foot found the projecting rock, a piece of quartz that stuck out from the rough hewn wall. The blow was too weak, too feeble to have brought the action that followed. The rock seemed to quiver like the flesh of a beast when stabbed. A queer vibration went through that ancient rock. Then a deep, gasping sigh. He had waited too long. Fear came swiftly upon him, crowding him while his body twisted, contracting into the smallest possible space. He tried to will his muscles to move beneath the growing sounds that vibrated through the passage. The whispers of rock grew into a terrible groan, and there was a rattle of pebbles, then silence. The silence was more horrifying than the sound. Somehow he was crawling, even as he expected the avalanche of gold to bury him. Abruptly, his feet were in the open. He was out. He ran without stopping, but behind him, he heard a roaring roar that he couldn't outrace. When he knew the slope of the land that he must be safe from the falling rock, he fell to his knees. He turned and looked back. The muted, roaring sound, like the thunder beyond mountains, continued, but there was no visible change in the tower. Suddenly, as he watched, the whole rock formation seemed to shift and tip. The movement lasted only seconds, but before the tons of rock had found their new equilibrium, his tunnel and the area around it had utterly vanished from sight. When he could finally stand, Weatherton gathered up his sack of ore and his canteen. The wind was cool on his face as he walked away, and he did not look back again.